a lot of what I learned there end up helped me out with what I do as a as a streamer, as a creator, and just being able to handle everything from that end. Because it was it was sales, it was like marketing, it was um direct marketing. So meaning I would actually stand out in front of the store and just be like, hey, come check out our product. Welcome to the Metaverse DGen. I'm Lion. And there's no rap today. He's off doing a job. So it's just me and this guest. Who are you? Yo, how are y'all doing? Did my hand just die? My hand just died. Oh. <laughs> it's fine. Ah, well, it kind of looks <laughs> you're having pur- uh, purposeful hand placement. <laughs> tastefully, tastefully speaking, it's fine. <laughs> oh, well, who are you and what is it you're known for in, in this virtual world? What's up? My name is Shadow. I am all over the place. I like to DJ. I like to hang around with, uh, talk with friends, meet new people, and uh, um, I also do some VTubing on the side. So yeah. Oh, so what got you started with all that and VR chat? What pulled you here? So VR chat, or which one? All three. <laughs> I'm gonna keep on your toes. All three. All right. All right. All right. All right. So VR chat, I actually explored a long time ago. Back when I graduated high school, I saw the beta for it back in like 2014. So I've I've been around oh. delving here and there. Yeah, but I really started exploring it um, once I got uh, once the quarantine hit. I passed through again every every couple of years to like kind of see how the development has been, but really dived in during the quarantine, and that's when I really got to start sinking my teeth into a lot more of what VR chat has to offer. Hmm. Wow. So yeah. What made you want to pick up and try VR chat back in 2014? So I've always been interested in the realm of virtual reality. Uh, like I've loved science fiction growing up. So like I grew up with like Tron, you know, mm. <laughs> Tron matrix, uh, Code Lyoko, like, uh, like I said, when we when we were coming in through this world, and just I've been a gamer, and so like I want to, I love the whole concept of like full diving into virtual reality and just being the ideal person you can and want to be, as well as just cool like getting out of the the world we live in and living in the impossible. Mm. Oh, so what was VR chat like back in twenty fourteen? earliest i started was what late 2020 early 2021 somewhere in that zone so i have no idea what 2014 so, was like 2014 was pretty bare bones i don't remember if the pug was there necessarily there were a lot of um there were a lot of early early games that it, they were just kind of more like test maps kind of a deal that were just like what you'd expect of like developers first unity project kind of a kind of a world Mm. um the people there i remember it was um from like the early days of like the youtubers where it was more like how do i put this like when 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 it was like the big markiplier jacksepticeye era when they were really starting out in youtube so it was like that era where it's like everyone's just kind of exploring what this place has to offer Mm. And then later on, you know, time goes on, people start jumping in and um, creating all these crazy games in here. So, yeah. Oh, so how'd you get started with the VTubing and the DJing? What what was it like when you were just getting into your crafts? Okay, so the VTubing also picked up during quarantine, but for the past decade, also back in 2014, as soon as I got out of high school, I got my own pre built pc and i knew i wanted to be a youtuber just like like i said the aforementioned jacksepticeye mark pewds you name it they're they've been my heroes for a long time and so i wanted to do what they do and i also wanted to do a lot more of the competitive gaming scene kind of just like sick nasty montage 2006 air horns you know that whole vibe and like really showcase like i'm good enough to be playing for the mlg or like I want to play for the MLG or like competitive gaming realm as well as um let's plays cuz let's plays are a big thing to me cuz I love video games like I said and I know what it's like to not have enough to 
be able to like you see this game you see the trailer you get so hyped you want to buy it but you know your wallet's just a little bit short to buy it and like when you're in school you don't have you don't you know you only got enough pocket change to like grab a soda with the friends kind of thing right so like i wanted to use the realm of let's plays as a way of like hey here's a game you wanted to check out if you want to check it out for yourself let me show you let, let me walk you through it and if you want to stick with me for the whole adventure, I'm going to play the whole game with you. So we can, we can enjoy the ride together. Mm. And so that, that's, that's where it all started. And I have a, amassed a library. And I almost got scammed out of that library. But I clutched it and I saved it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Oh. So yeah. So that, that, that's where my VTubing and YouTubing came in. So I, I switched between using my models and face camming is just some days I just don't feel like putting a shirt on. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. How'd you get started with the DJing in the whole club scene then? What attracted you to there? How'd All right. Go? So the DJing stuff. So I've actually have a long history um, music uh, background. Ever since I was in second grade, I was in uh, my my family picked up uh, had me pick up guitar as like a after school type program. Mm. My dad is actually a DJ himself. He's been spinning on vinyls since the 80s. So I've grown up listening to everything he listened to, plus whatever was on my iPod at the time. So one second, my iPod could be playing uh, Black Sabbath. And then all of a sudden, I get um, Depeche Mode. And then all of a sudden, I get Kesha. And then Green Day. And then whatever. So that was how it all started. Like my, I, I remember seeing my dad do a lot of the vinyls, and I never thought it was going to be for me either. That it was not something I would pick up. But after 2015, when I went to my first rave, that's when I really started to gain an appreciation for electronic music and then delve into that. One of my friends brought me to my very first rave, saw how he did it, Nothing stopped him from doing it, um, from his shortcomings, and, and always look up to him for that. And alongside my dad, of just like we, he he took me to a lesson one time, and he's always like he's always had me like you want to try it out, you want to try it out, you want to try it. I'm like, all right, fine. And so like I did, a, I've done a couple spin sessions for my dad's gear, tried it out here and there, never really be like, ah, oh, all right, let's do this. And now here I am in VR and playing, not only spinning here in VR, but also at my local bar and with friends and just going through all that and just learning everything about it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what was some of your, your, <laughs> some of your first shows like when you first started DJing? My first shows. Okay. So it's been it's kind of had a, it, it's been it's been an up and down like it, I was really trying to find myself in it where like I wanted to do a little bit of my own thing as who I am as Shadow the YouTuber VTuber as my own identity and then there's the also the version of it where it's like Shadow just like, hey, come play, come play for us, come play at our events. And then also my ambitiousness of, hey, I want to go play and rock out a, an, like, uh, an IRL venue of like 2,000 people. That's like, I always wanted to be a rock star and just get up on stage, you know, play, play for hundreds of people kind of thing. So those are the three different ways I've been tackling, tackling that concept. Because um, when you reached out to me, you reached out to the 4 a.m. Deadline Radio um, group that, that I run. And so 4 a.m. DR initially started as like a... All right, I start my stream at 8 p.m. Pacific, and 4 a.m. is when I finish. That's the cutoff point. So that's, that's where the name came from, 4 a.m. Deadline Radio. And when it comes to it, like that that's just like all right at that point everyone's barely waking up it's time to go to work you know and i've always liked being late night 
do, doing a lot more late night stuff because daytime hours is not not ideal for me. I don't like thinking during the day. I don't like I'm I'm not I become nocturnal and there goes my batteries. Okay, cool. We'll keep going. <laughs> and so that that that's how that ended up happening of just slowly trying to meld all three different concepts together. And it's just kind of snowballing, kind of fragmenting, then re-snowballing, fragmenting and re-snowballing into just something, if that makes sense. Hmm. But yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought, but it's oh, fine. <laughs> it's okay. Well, now that you mentioned uh, 4 a.m. Deadline Radio, what made you want to start that, and why do you continue doing it? So, with 4 a.m. Deadline Radio as a whole, I want it to be a project that helps that helps out everyone here in VR. First and foremost, our biggest phrase in the DJ community is make sure to record your set. Make sure to record your set. Make sure to record your set. And so I was like, all right, I know you have, like this is an important event to you. If you could see my hand gestures, I don't have them right now. Mm. <laughs> this is an important event to you, but like everyone's like, oh, I wish I could have recorded that. I wish I, I wish I could have recorded that. And that was like way back, like that was back during the, the quarantine era. And so going forward, like I said, like, hey, I, I want to help. I want to help you out. I want to make sure you get your, your sets recorded. And so that's when I took it upon myself of like, all right, I want I want to make sure like you get like you get your sets. So, so and then also want to show off a lot more of the events that are in here, you know, from the big groups like like Shelter, like Lyoko, Concrete, you name it. That's all out there. They all have their own channels they all have those like they have their own sets and programs for that but i also want to like i like i wanted to do it for like a lot a lot of like the um, the more i guess you could, you could say smaller ones for like the ones who never really got a chance to, like to perform there yet because it, it it's hard to to get booked anywhere it's like Sometimes you gotta submit your stuff. Sometimes it's word of mouth. Sometimes you gotta rec- get recommended. It's it's a little bit of everything in that nature. And just there's also a lot of the we um we want this specific type of thing. We want this kind of thing. With a radio station, with like an IRL radio station, you just tune in to wherever you go, and you'll hear some of the wildest stuff. Where one station can be hip hop, one station can be rock, one station can be Latin, and so on and so forth. 4AMDR does not care. It's whatever you're passionate about, what you want to play, is more than welcome. What matters is, do you have the courage to come up and play? And that's all we ask of you. Okay. Yeah. So what kinds of things have you learned or picked up from running for 4 4AM? What have I picked up? Well, it's less so what have I... Well... There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to that. In that, yeah. So I've been. I mainly look at it from the business side of things. In that, first and foremost, my degree is in business management. Mm. Um, second off is I'm also trained in journalism. So I have a little bit of both of those. So I wanted. I use 4MDR as a platform for me to not only practice those but also apply it in a way that it will be the stepping stone bridge for everyone that comes through. Hmm. What I want to do with 4AMDR is help be a foot in the door for anyone who wants to go into the mainstream, who wants to start playing for IRL spaces, that they can have that bridge point of like, the one thing every artist needs is a portfolio. Let me help you set that up. Let me, let me do that for you. Let me do that with you. And then as I looked more into the music industry and just how predatory and how disgustingly competitive it can be, and like, I, it, it, I, I, like, I say, like, I want to destroy it from the ground up and rebuild it so that way everyone wins. I'm a co-op mm-hmm. gamer. I want to make sure everyone gets their fair share that everyone can succeed and grow with it. So I want to be that stepping stone. If people want to foot in the door i'll be the battering ram that's what i want to do with it Mm. and so i've been looking into a lot of like the business plans on how to and what to do and 
one of my classes I took in university was being able to to do music management, and I helped an artist with um, with working in the studio. So like, like trying to apply what I've learned with the bare bones of not having fully done it myself, but being in there with everyone and learning it as we go mm. to make sure everyone gets their share and everyone can grow and push forward and like make it, you know, whatever it is you want to do that constu- const- constitutes as making it to you. Mm. And that's where, that's where I want to go with it. Okay. So do I. So, yeah. um, what drives you to do that? What made you want to go into VR and start this uh, 4 a.m. radio in order to do that goal? What drives you for it? There's, there's a lot that goes with it. Um, I myself, like I said, I'm a musician. And then as a YouTuber, as a creator, as, a, as everything, I, t- I want to make it up there. Like I want to make it to the big leagues myself too. But, but that... I want it to be in the way of like, all right, you guys are trying your best. I'm going to do my best too. I'm right here, right beside you guys. All right. Like I'm going to learn how to do all this stuff too. So that way, like, yeah. So that, that, that's the driving force behind it of, of it that we'll, we'll, we'll grow together. We'll grow together and we'll shoot for the moon. And even if, if we miss, we'll, we'll still be with the stars, Mm. (laughs) you know? So it's like that. Wow. It's a lot of that. Yeah. Okay. How long has 4AM Radio been around and what kind of experiences uh, came across your path in order to apply your skill with business management and journalism? Um, so we start, officially we started around 2021, if I remember correctly. It was somewhere around that. Like it was already like a year after I was in it, after I was DJing. So started out with um with yes and monochrome as like our um from from that end of the scene, and then slowly um I had to deal with the balancing between doing my own solo stuff of handling my own channel, and then um and then handling for MDR in it as a whole. And so I'm pulling a blank right now. So that that that's that's how we started and then going from there we started recording some of the events. We've done charity events throughout each year. Um all hands on deck. That was our that's always our yearly biggest event that we do, which is a charity event for the Trevor project to help raise money for the LGBT youth. And with that I wanted that to be the driving force to bring every club together because I see so much discourse out there mm-hmm. of like this and that and it's it's not what raving's all about. Raving is about players, it's about being together. Mm-hmm. Peace, love, unity, and respect. That we're all here for the music, the dance floor. And so yeah. Mm-hmm. So that that that's how we that's how we got our start on that and so the way it worked for me with business is um at one point i was a photographer with um with uh one of the groups and then i learned how to create a spreadsheet with that and so from there i learned how to how to organize times organize and then just reaching out to other djs to dancers to vjs photographers and I also took it upon myself to be the camera person that I would record everyone's sets. So with Ahod, like that was me making sure, like, all right, cool. Is this person ready? Is this person ready? Is this person ready? Do I have your link? Do I have your link? Do I have your link? You know your time. All right, cool. Do you need more time? All right, cool. Go for the next five minutes. You know, things like that. So that that's how it was for me on the business side of it. And then that that that's the main part of it. The other half of it is um that I would be handling the Dropbox and I would make sure that the DJs got their sets, that I would send them the links directly and make sure that they got it. That was always like, that was always the big part of that. Um, and like, we would have the in-world stuff that we would record. Like I would, <laughs> at one point before we had the flying cameras, I would 
actually just take the camera and run around the entire map to kind of like showcase, yeah, yeah, this is how cool VR is, you know, like all that stuff. That, and that, that that's how we would do it. Um, and now, oh, now we have a new addition to it. With um, huge shout out to uh, to my co to my co-host uh, Vampirica, who's helped carry so much of the weight in the recent in the recent days with it of um helping showcase individuals versus the whole events mm. where we we ask um one of the djs in the same way that um that oh, i'm trying to remember with, with black Out boys i think it's black box no no not black not black box the oh, i'm pulling a blank on on his podcast right now um Sorry, I'm so sorry. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, there there's another um, there's another DJ in the community who does like a radio podcast um, to showcase DJs as well. And so the way we do it a little differently is we provide we will uh, we'll publish you on YouTube for you, and then after that we were gonna do we're also gonna do an interview as well to go into the mind of the artist. In a way, like live at Daryl's house um, that I used to watch on like V8, I think it's VH1, and we would do that. We would showcase like, so what got you here into VR? What, um, and then just like I said, go into the mind of them, go into what makes what makes them tick, what makes their work part of them, and all of that. And so our last one was with Ambrosia VR. Um, um, and all of her stuff is live. We did. We talked to Realmlist. We talked to Snacks and Noir. And um, we hope to do more in the future. It's just time is not the best. Time is a difficult mistress to uh, to work with. Mm. But that also ties to my journalistic skills of um, interviewing people. Mm. So yeah, Ooh. yeah. So. How many specific instances were you able to use journalism or your business degree in VR? Like uh, more specific moments of like this is there's this one time kind of thing, I guess. Because I'm curious uh, how you use those here in VR chat. So with my journalism stuff, again back. To, uh, I'm gonna keep running back to the quarantine days since that's really where things uh, is like the nexus point of everything. <laughs> mm. Um. So for my journalism stuff, I would at uh, uh, one stream I went to um I would just scour the publics, meet random people, let them know like, hey, I'm streaming, um, and then just let them know like, hey, I'm a journalist, and then we just talk about random stuff. We would just talk about whatever. At one point, uh, someone was talking to me about um like, all right, so you're a business major, tell me about the economics of such and such, and then I would just kind of like, kind of use my insights as to what's actually happening on the bigger threads and i do this with um even now on the gaming side of just so here's the situation here's how things actually look from the macro scale behind the scenes of what's happening on the corporate side and that's how i that's how i approach a lot of things is like so a lot of the times people see things from the user level but it's it's like a stage show it's like a broadway show what you see is the end product but what you don't see is everyone running around, moving the sandbags, making sure your costume department's all good. That's where I'm at as the business side. As a journalist side, it's me going into the crowd and asking, like, hey, what's your thoughts on this? What is this? What is that? And that's what it was. But my all-time favorite interview I've ever done was I met a, an opera singer. And that'll always be one of my best memories. She was absolutely adorable, and her voice was just magnificent. And I really hope she's still pursuing that dream of being an opera singer. And I mm. hope that one day I could see her perform. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's actually pretty impressive that you're able to so, yeah. apply your, your degree like that. Um, what kinds of things have you uh, learned in the process of doing that with people that's a tough call that's a tough call mm. um in terms of um 
learning something new, not too much. Mm-hmm. As like I still it, it's more just solidifying what I've learned thus far. Mm-hmm. Because even though I even though I've been doing a lot of writing with my journalism stuff, it's mostly been one semester in high school, but it was a journalism focused high school. Like that like is a magnet school. Mm. And then um when I transferred schools, I was I still applied to be on the newspaper team and get my um actually like go out and like write news articles. So normally I like writing reviews. A lot of times that's my favorite thing to do is just write a review. Hence which ties back to my let's playing, you know, it's like but the thing about being a journalist is having the unbiased and just showing the objective, right? Mm. <clears throat> and so that's that's one of the key things I learned as um, while doing reporting is being able to find the whole, like the hard facts, knowing how to quote things, knowing how to just give out, like give. Let's see, putting the de- details the way it needs to it needs to be, and so that way it's understandable for everybody. Mm. kind of thing that, that that's that's the big part like um back in university i would also do some um some field reporting um for our for our newspaper and we've had we've had a couple events happen um that let's see i'm gonna say is like the 2016 election was a moment that was definitely a moment and just i remember just hearing out on campus like it wasn't like it wasn't a riot, but it was just more like a gathering, a protest, these kinds of things. Mm. And so I would like just kind of like get the word on the street, like that kind of thing. So it's more of a more of a a solidification of everything I knew from my from the writing format to being able to ask the important questions, you know, the five W's and H. And then um, all of those things. And then just applying that. Now it's just applying that to the music realm. And that, that's where the journalism stuff has really been leaning more towards. And I actually took that. My, my skills of just reaching out to random people and saying, hey, can I interview you really quick? And I took that out to PAX West last year. And, and I got to interview one of the devs from uh from a new game that came out recently uh pacific drive and that's honestly one of my more prouder recent works that i'm really glad i got to um i really got to get out there Hmm. so So, yeah what pulled you to business and journalism as a degree in the outside world and have you ever used either of those outside of vr so originally my degree was computer science and engineering because again, video games, <laughs> right? But I uh, physics and coding were not my forte, and that's when I was like, "Nope, I cannot do this." Um, and then, like, I had to tell my parents. Like, that was the biggest thing that I was worried about it was just coming to my parents and be like, "I don't want to do. I don't want to do this anymore." Uh, and then I just was like, "Hmm, business, you say? It's an easy three year out. All right, cool." I just need to do this many units. All right, good. And then, <laughs> and then just like during the, you know, and I, I knew I was going to be doing like every semester. So that includes spring, summer, winter, fall, you know, like I would be in all semesters until I finished it. I was like, all right, cool. I could do this and still be ahead of time. All right, perfect. So that that's how I got into a business degree. Mm. Now, applying that degree outside of VR that's ugh. so my first my first and technically really only job was um was sales mm. and so that's where that was the closest i could get to it but it wasn't what i expected out of it i don't get me wrong i still i still hold those those work memories well enough too and then a lot of what i learned there ended up Helped me out with what I do as a as a streamer, as a creator, and just being able to handle everything from that end. Because it was it was sales, it was like marketing, it was um direct marketing. So meaning I would actually stand out in front of the store, 
and just be like, hey, come check out our product. You know, like that kind of stuff. water bottle, please. Uh, uh, and so like, it was just be like, hey, come check out our product. And then learn all these little subtleties that make, that make, uh, that really show charisma. I, I'd say if I was to really put my, if I was to kind of explain what I've learned and how I've applied it into life, is that I run a dex build with some extra points in charisma and int. Mm. That, I, I'd say that's kind of how it is. <laughs> <laughs> so for, the, for all the D&D nerds out there. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that, 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 that's where I, that's where, where and how. So the business side of it was, um, was more um, how to handle a team, how to take care of the new starts, um, how to show them what you do and make them do what you can do and then go above and beyond. And so to kind of apply that um, to what I do as a streamer, creator, and all the different... Like, it's all just a system. And, and so I looked at that, uh, what we did. It turns out it was a whole MLM. And we're not going to delve on that, though. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, but a lot of it is valid in the sense of just what you can do with it. And that, like the skills that you can learn from it. Of like being able to, being able to hold your own, maintain your mentality, knowing how to play the odds, things like that, knowing how to create a conversation, knowing how to do all those kinds of things. That that's that's what I learned while I was in sales. Hmm. That that's the closest my degree could do. Because honestly, I was kind of just a party boy. I was just kind of a party boy jock in uh in university uh don't get me wrong i still stayed in my classes i still passed my classes uh but like it was just more like, like oh cool bare minimum say no more <laughs> mm. <laughs> kind of thing it, it was that i but i really paid a lot more attention in a lot more of the elective classes like um music art uh writing though that was really where i really want to spend more of my time I'm on. Yes, I do know how this just how it's how the statistics works, as well as like yeah, I can I can do stocks too. I know how to do stocks, but hmm, eh. <laughs> is, is that yeah hmm. Now, what about journalism? Since you said you have, you have a degree in that as well, have you ever had any applications of that in the outside world? Is it only here on your own? Hello, I want to quickly interrupt your video. Please come follow us on any of our socials. We have a card down that way in the description, metaversedjigcard.co. You can find us on Discord. You can find us on Twitter, which X, whatever. Right here in this space, you'll see the at. You can find me, Lion. And as well, we have a Patreon, which we've started a whole other show as a thank you for those who've signed up, such as Training Fangs, Forbidden Zero, and Niche. So thank you all for watching the video on how these games are knowing. I'll leave you to the rest of it. Enjoy. Um, so I don't have a degree in journalism, but like I said, I've done enough of it. it it's more of my practice than it is mm. anything else. Okay. So I do own a Medium account. So Medium is like kind of where I can publish my own stuff. So when I was working in sales, at one point I moved to Louisiana. And while I was there, I got to check out a uh, while I was doing door to door sales with out there, I ended up meeting uh, a guy who opened up his own restaurant. And through him, I actually got to interview him, check out the restaurant on like a pre opening day, take pictures and just publish and show it off. Um, and I, I still remember I still remember that place today, and I hope that I can go back and check it out. And so that that's where I've applied my journalism outside of the space. I actually have a lot of um of news of articles that I've been wanting to write, more opinion editorials, really, that really like again talk about a lot of the stuff I do talk about on my live streams on the regular, where it's the current state of gaming, where it's just all these different things, whether it's a movie review, a game review, all those things. That that's where my journalistic skills mostly come into application, but the monkey's paw curls and another tab opens. And so I have I have like five windows with over a hundred tabs each. And one window is just Word documents. And it I, it breaks my heart to open that to open up and see that every time. 
and I just want to write. I want to publish all these stories, but I can't. Like, as it, 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 a lot of what a lot of art is striking while the iron is hot. But the second I sit down and open that document, all things go out the window, and I'm just like, shit. And it's the same with my music, too. And editing videos and all of that. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm. It, 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 I'm pulled in so many different directions that it's... I want to be able to do all these things, and, like, I know I can. I know I can. And I have done each of them individually when the time feels right. But the drive and the motivation and keeping that up is the hardest part of it. So, yeah. Hmm. So that, that, that's why my, a lot of my journalism stuff has kind of been on the back burner. Hmm. So, yeah. So of yeah. all the projects you're working, what have been your main focuses? And why have you decided to focus on those over the rest? As of right now, my main focus is my streaming. That's uh, first and foremost. I love I love doing the YouTube stuff. I love doing the Twitch stuff. I love showcasing video games, and I video games are my passion first and foremost. Of my many dreams I've had since I was a kid, number one is being a rock star. Absolutely. Number two is doing game dev. In the game dev realm, I've really narrowed it down to three points where I want to be in. I want to do level design, music composition, and voice acting. Those are the three things I wanted to I want to do in the realm of video games. Mm. And so that's kind of really where I've been focusing a lot of my my work effort is just getting videos out there. And so on the YouTube side when I stream there, it's mostly let's plays. So right now we're doing Lies of P and tonight is actually going to be the last episode. Um, of the of the playthrough, and I'm really excited for that because that's a Souls like game that I saw at the Game Awards a couple years ago that I really wanted to delve into. And then Final Fantasy 14, so we do Final Fantasy Fridays, and I, I have a very hilarious alliterative nomenclature. So that that's how I do things. So yeah, and I've been enjoying those journeys and just been writing them out. Alongside that, I do Destiny, which is like. My my number one game and like i've been following that journey also for the past 10 years and that's where i've been doing my best to do to find how i want to do those with those let's plays but as of recently i've just kind of just been throwing it all the wind and just figuring out just throwing throwing stuff out there for the algorithm you know it's that definitely playing the content creator game is not the same way it used to be all those years ago it's not it's not the same beast that we have that that we had back then, it's definitely a chimeric hydra, for sure. Mm. So that's that's where my efforts have been as of recently. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. How have you been trying to pick up and adapt to the changing chimeric hydra as you described? The thing about YouTube is, uh, it's very algorithm based. It really favors. So this ties back to what I learned back in sales. Number one thing you want to do is consistency. So I've been I've been on top of it of having a at least a consistent upload schedule. Whenever I live stream, whenever I always have a moment of just like, all right, hit record, go go go, kind of thing, and just like, I I always say I'm going to edit it. There might be a chance I will edit one of these videos one day, but I end up just recording for a whole last hour and was like, it's something, throw it to the wind <laughs> and go. Um. Yeah, so that, that that's kind of how that's been. But also, I've been throwing my D, a couple of my DJ sets up there, I, and I, I still get a chance to still play some music out for everybody. To deal with the YouTube algorithm, uh, I've been trying my best to upload more shorts, more clips, um, handling more snappier titles, but also more straightforward ones, too. Um, I've been working on my thumbnail game recently. I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud that I've been at least been making enough thumbnails for every new stream, every new video. I'm I'm okay with that at least. I might not be editing, but my photoshopping has been <laughs> fun. So I at least have fun with. If there's one thing I like to edit, it's Photoshop, and that's where that's where my uh, that's where my, most of my effort goes now. 
with, with a with a YouTube game. And I've honestly I've been doing better than I have the last however many years doing it. It's small growth, but growth that I can say like, all right. Hey, we at least got it to ten people. Sweet, fuck yeah! You know, it's that. Mm. Doesn't matter whether it's one view, a hundred views, or a thousand views. If, if people can enjoy what I make, I'm happy about that. And yeah, that, that, that's 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 what matters most. Mm. Is that you can? It takes you out of your day, whatever troubles you're facing. That hey. Come on, let's let's enjoy some video games together. Mm. So yeah. Okay. Now I'm gonna yeah. do some hardcore whiplash because I'm really, really good at that. <laughs> Back in the beginning, you said so. Go some. for it. Go for it. Fair warning, I do that all the time. So brace, brace your neck. Um, way in the beginning, you Bring said it. you went to a journalism high school. I've never heard of that. What is that? And what was it? Yes. Like? <laughs> all right. So I. Uh, I, hmm. I don't want to dox myself per se, but like I, it's kind of public information, I guess, because I I have I am published. I am published from both my high schools. Um, so the first one, the first high school I went to is named after a journalist, um, Daniel Pro Magnet, and I'm I'm proud to say I got I got to attend there, and learn what I could from there. So that was my first high school. The second one is a well-known um, private high school, all guys Catholic high school, uh, Crespi. And so, so the way a magnet is, it's it's that halfway point between a public school and a charter school. So where public school is fully government funded, magnets are also publicly uh, publicly funded, but just a little bit more, if that makes sense. So that's why they're more specialized. So Daniel Pro Magnet High School is focused on journalism because Daniel Pearl was a journalist um, back during um, a very rough time in our history, post um, uh, post two thousand one. Uh, let's go with that mm. for uh, yeah for audience sake. So yeah, and then charter schools are like private schools, but they act like public schools, if that makes sense. Where they're, it, it has a little bit of a half and half funding between the public and private sector. Mm. That that's kind of how charter schools work. So, and then private schools are private schools. It's it's kind of in the name. So yeah, that that that's how that that's how that came to be. Mm. Yeah. So what was it like going to a magnet school for journalism? Honestly, it felt like an honor. Mm. It was um. I was I was I was really happy to go to that school. It was just up the street from where I lived. It was walking distance. Um, um I love the teachers. They were a lot of fun. They everyone was very like everyone was very unique. Um I will always remember um Miss Chavira who was my uh, who was the journalism teacher and I still take her lessons to heart from what she from what she taught me and all, um, and just how to write a news article, and, and everyone that was on the newspaper team, like had their specific articles. Like, taught she taught me like her classes taught me how to write a review. Well, like I said, reviewing is one of my favorite things. But I remember, like, for the senior class, um, they would get to like actually work, work on the newspaper from formatting it to editing it, to writing articles, and everything. And I remember one time, um, we had a writing competition. I got to compete in that. It was at, it was at CSUN, uh, Cal State University, Northridge. And I got seventh place in that, in that one. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, I can't, I can't believe I still remember that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, writing competition. And then one time we got to go to, like, a restaurant as, like, a little, yeah, we did it kind of thing. And I remember... Um, one of the seniors was taking pictures of the food at the restaurant. And then a week later, I see it published in the monthly newspaper as like a review. I'm like, nice. Mm. One of my favorite articles I wrote um, was with my best friends. With two of my best friends from my Halo days. And I, uh, they're twins. Mm. 
one went to the school I was like one went to the magnet I was in the other one went to um the the school that was like right next door and like I they were both on the track team and I still remember them to this day and like I still do my best to keep up with both of them and like yeah so that that that's where that ended up being so yeah magnet schools we don't get our own sports team. We share it with the other, with the other half, of, <laughs> with the other school. So that, that's that's how that worked. That's how that worked. <laughs> oh. So how? Yeah. What was it like interacting with the main, the main school, the magnet main school, magnet school between the two? Did they uh, usually work well together, or was it a different kind of relationship? Yeah. It was. It was pretty well symbiotic. So like. Um, I would, um, so since we shared the sports teams, um, I joined the swim team. And so, like, we would leave through, like, one of the side gates of our campus and, and then go right next door to the pool of the other campus. And that's how we would do it. All the sports players from our school would walk on over to the other school and we would basically be part of their team. That's how that worked. Um, I don't know how it works at other magnets, but that's how it worked with ours. Um, but we would have our own pep rallies. Mm. Like we had our own Pride Days. We had our own um specific school holidays. We had our own newspaper. So that we were kind of like we were a separate school, shared sports team kind of thing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty interesting that they work together, but also you have your own celebrations. So I. Thank you for sharing mm-hmm. that. I, I learned a few things. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hmm. So Hell yeah. Going back to 4AM Radio again a little bit, what have been some of your more mm-hmm. memorable moments running 4AM Radio with you and the rest of the team? Hmm. So one of my favorite ones that I ran was um one of my favorite events next to, uh, to AHOD, All Hands on Deck, was um when I got to reach out to uh, Palace, uh, the Palace. I I don't remember what what if they if they go by a new name or anything like that. And that's where I got to um that's where I got to uh, record Kizzle, New Gen, and uh, oh shoot, I'm, I, God, there's it's so long ago I can't remember that lineup off the top of my head. Kizzle, New Gen, Maiden, and uh, it was just fun. Like it was it was at the peak Froggy Car era. Mm. That that that's when we played that. And that was one of the first times Nugent got to um to play a, at a at a venue, hmm. and so like, yeah. And I'll always hold that memory fondly because like Palace, I went to way before they they really blew up to where they are now, and um, it was really cool that I got to work with them. Uh, and that was like the that was when uh, Monochrome and Palace uh, did a crossover event. So that's that that was our that was that that was like one of our first like collab events that we ran and i i still i still listen to kizzle's set from that night and just vibe out to it like that that was just a lot of fun hmm. so, yeah that, that's one of my fondest memories with it hmm. what uh, what about that night being one of your earlier events make the the event memorable it was a big stage. It was it was a big stage. So Palace is kind of a big world. It's more on like the the club or uh, the more of the uh, the drinking night uh club type club type scene. But getting to see all my friends' visuals and just vibe out and dance to those to those sets out there while like half of everyone is like out on the other side just kind of chatting and gaming while the other half is like on the dance floor. Mm. And just still hearing like everyone give their best, and like just being like, "Oh my god, like I can't believe I just did that," and just like learning how to like really showing them like the back door of like, "All right, so here's the pin code to to get to the stage." Blah blah blah. Don't worry, we got your links. While the staff, while the main venue staff is doing their own thing and like handling their own night, like it was like kind of like it was like it was a mix of like. Two different sides knowing knowing their own like knowing their roles kind of kind of thing if that makes sense like mm. all right we know what we got to do on our side we got you covered on that we know what all right i got this side of like all right i'll make sure everyone gets is on their is on their point kind of thing you know and it's no different than how i kind of just run a run a team in in uh in a lot of my gaming so yeah 
Hmm. Okay. What about the VR chat uh, music and club scene a- attracts you to it? Why do you keep on going back and want to do stuff with it? It's there's a lot of heart in there. There's a lot of heart in there. Every single person, absolutely beautiful, passionate, and dedicated to it. Everyone I've seen play, everyone I've heard play, absolutely phenomenal. Everyone. There's so much to it. I love I love raving. I love the energy. I love the people. You know, like no matter what, we got, we're all there to support the homies. Every event is always out to support the homies. Whether it's five people or five full instances, we're still there to cheer each other on, enjoy some good ass music, go wild, and, you know, make memories with our friends. And that's always what it's been about. And that's my favorite part of it. So yeah, mm. and I—it's uh, hard nowadays. It's really hard nowadays because everyone's got an event going on at the same time sometimes, even. And so it's hard to be everywhere at once. But no matter what, like in my heart, I know everyone's gonna be playing their fucking best. Whether it's that last-minute crate, the fuck it crate. Or the crate you took the most time to build and curate for yourself that means everything to you. I know you guys are doing your best out there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Take your time. Thank you for sharing that. It's appreciated. Yeah. Um what was your Thank you. what was your first uh instance of being in the VR chat club scene? How did you get into it? Man, I'll never forget that night. So I was hanging out in a, in a, in a random black cat instance. And then um, I run into this little, uh, this little cat uh, named, uh, his name is Venger. I've known him for a while now. And like, I still remember and I was like, hey, so where's, where's the party scene at? Right. And so like, I ask him, he's like, oh man, there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff. And the first event I went to was VR Egypt Techno Day Magenta 20. 21? 2021 or 2020. And that night was just absolutely amazing. Like, so the thing about VR Egypt is that it's not just one venue. It's like five venues in one. Because they can change it at the on the whim. That one second it can be your regular ass, like, you know, neon nightclub bar kind of thing. All of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, you're in a mushroom forest cave. And then in a blink of eye, you're in a in a Sakura garden. And then blink of night, you're in um in a cy- cyberpunk world. And then of course you got the Egypt map. And I remember that night, um Ohm 3 was playing, and that was just I was blown away by 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 his set. And then um I, I met a lot of great people that night, and they're they're also friends that i still hold dear to this day and i still keep in touch with everyone from there that i can mm. yeah mm. what was it like for you seeing that side of vr chat for the first time like yeah i was i was blown away it was everything i wanted and more mm. it was everything i wanted and more crazy beep boop bop music colorful outfits from everything from your robots to your regular ravers and neon and um and just a world unlike our own but very much like our own that we're all there for the enjoyment of it that uh that that's very much a lot of that Hmm. yeah okay um well thank you very much for speaking with us tonight it's been an absolute pleasure getting to speak with and meet you so thank you for your time shadow thank you Well, thank you, thank you. No yeah. problem. Where can the audience find you if they wish to find you? Oh, the best place to be is Twitter at ShadowWolf82. That's uh, that's the best place to uh, to catch up with me. I retweet a lot of art. I retweet a lot of the the scene. Um, I retweet a lot of gaming, and um, I'll do my best to kind of keep you up on current events. Um, if you guys want to see any of my let's plays at ShadowWolf Gaming, that's Wolf with a U. Um. I'm live every Tuesday and Friday on there or Twitch um, 
at Shadowwolf82. I'm always there, almost daily. So, yeah. Um, and you can always find me here in VR. You can always find me here in VR. If I'm on Blue, you're always welcome to come party with me. And you can always share the dance floor, all right? There's always room and a hug for you. Always. Mm. And if you want to catch our main project with 4 a.m. Deadline Radio, catch up with us on there. Join our, join any of the discords I'm in. Support all the homies. And I'll always catch you here in the virtual space that we call home. Mm. Always. Well, hope reach out, go say hi to Shadow Wolf here. Normally, Raptor does the thing where he does the closing. Usually, it's motivational. Ah, step out of your... Do me a favor, step outside your little box, go experience something new, and do something you said you would always do but haven't. Unity and Blender is free, damn it. <laughs> Have a good night. See you at the Metaverse. <laughs> <laughs>